So let's get started. And I would like to remind you that we will have two hours class today, but on Friday there will be no class. But next Tuesday and next Friday, and yeah, so let, let's see, oops, sorry. Um, there will be classes next week. Let's have this ready. And we'll continue with this one. <clears throat> I, I decided to a little bit speed up and uh, cover many of the subjects that pertain to the sort of pre-1990s a little faster and expecting you to make your readings for better understanding. All right? So it is essential that you make your readings from this book, which I thought I lost it, and I found it somewhere in the, uh, on the shelves of my library at home. Um, so please try to sort of catch up if you have missed any classes, and the podcasts of this, these sessions will be available as far as I understand, starting from today. Yeah, and if you missed any of the classes, and if you so missed me, and then you can uh, sort of watch uh, the, the class deliberations uh, on the internet. So, um, and as far as I understand, anybody from around the world can watch this, right? Well, so we're teaching the world. So that's a good opportunity. And you can take more roles, if you like, by getting involved in the discussion, uh, taking part asking questions, making comments. Uh, if you like, you can turn to the camera and make yourself uh, known to the rest of the world. All right. Um, so we were talking about uh, basic uh, developments of the yardsticks, uh, sort of uh, the fundamental stones in the history of the Middle East. There are quite a number of issues that we cannot cover, of course, all of them. And this is not a department of history, and it's not a course on the history of the Middle East. But we are going to talk about, as far as we can, at the end of, till the end of the semester, on security issues. And since today, Middle East constitutes one of the most important topics in international security, of course, we have to uh, cover as many issues as possible, extending from proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, overarmament. I don't know if you noticed last Friday there was a um, TV interview right in the middle of the campus, uh, which is going to be broadcast this Thursday, actually, on Terete Haber and Terete Avas. Uh, the first one, Terete Haber, will broadcast on Thursday evening at, uh, at 11 p.m. in the evening, and Terete Avas will broadcast on Friday evening at 10 p.m. If you like to watch, uh, because we discussed with, together with Semihidis, uh, who is a prominent uh, journalist and who really covers uh, Middle East security issues as well as other security issues quite closely and uh, has a really huge background of knowledge. And um, we discussed the arms sale of, from the U.S. to Saudi Arabia, which amounts to $60 billion. And this is uh, the biggest, single most sort of uh, arms sale uh, amount in the history of U.S. arms sale as far as we know. Um, so therefore, uh, there are too many issues. Terrorism is one of the most important issues that we cover. And when people think about terrorism, uh, Middle East, they think about Middle East and things like that. So um, history is indeed history. So it's there. We cannot do much to change it. But we have to understand, it, of course, history and history of the region as to why things are now happening the way they do. I mean, uh, or why sort of groups are behaving um, the way they do uh, in the Middle East and also outside of the Middle East. And especially after 9-11, um, some of the developments that were taking place are also seen in other parts of the world where the Middle East has some common uh, denominators, like uh, Islam, religion. Uh, as to what impact it might have on the rest of the world, on, uh, on the world security, international security, stability, and things like that. So, therefore, we have to go as fast as possible, and because uh, I cannot give you every single detail about the history or, uh, you know, or uh, the, the diplomatic history of the region, and it is up to you to uh, read the chapters that are assigned from this book, the one that I mentioned last time as, in my opinion, you may agree, disagree with me, 
but I believe most of you will agree that it is a uh, rather balanced uh, book when it comes to uh, covering Middle East uh, politics, Middle, Middle East history, because there are basically, as I mentioned before, two uh, sort of approaches. One uh, approach, uh, the issues from uh, one's perspective, the Israeli perspective or Zionist perspective, the other approach is the issue from Arab perspective. So, and try to emphasize certain things or uh, um, undermine certain other things. Well, of course, they may still be counted as scholarly work, well, to some extent, depending on how you uh, interpret this and how, what, expect, what do you expect from a scholarly study. But this one I strongly recommend for uh, reading. Um, as I said, chapters are available, and the pages that you will be expected to read are indicated in the syllabus. You can go ahead and uh, read them. Uh, but before we get started with uh, from where we left last time, I want to know if uh, uh, you guys are coming together and, and discuss issues with, pertaining to simulation, and especially uh, members of Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Are there any one of them here? What about Jordan? Jordan? Jordan, just you. And what about, uh, do you know who the uh, three other people are? Please get a copy or check your emails. I, I must have sent this as an email attachment and figure this out and as to whom are your team members because otherwise you will have to be representing Jordan all by yourself. Uh, you have the list but you don't know who he or she is. All right, so well, of course I'll make a final notice. I'll send an email and those who will fail to show up next time, meaning next Tuesday, then they will probably be dropped from the simulation list and that 25% will be off, right? So uh, it is up to everyone's uh, expense, uh, so to speak, in terms of grades. If, they don't, if you don't show up regularly, if you just put the burden on the rest of the team members, then of course you cannot be qualified to take part in the simulation and therefore you will not have a chance to get this 25%. So this is not a punishment, but on the contrary, this is something that aims at you know, protecting the rights of those who act regular, uh, like uh, regular students. So uh, we cannot let people to just uh, uh, exploit this. All right. So, um, and uh, one of you, Mitin, I guess, uh, where is he? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, you sent me an email to set up a uh, discussion or a meeting in my office today. Well, I will not be available during the break because I will have class in the afternoon, but in the meantime, I will have to go uh, to the city. Uh, but I will send you emails and uh, sort of uh, indicate this five or maybe ten minute uh, slots which I will try to make during the breaks, I mean, during the lunch break. Well, uh, it will not cover all of your lunch break, so it will cover only 10 minutes of your time during this one hour break uh, from uh, half past noon to 1.30. So any, next week, maybe on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, you will have to come with all the other members of, uh, uh, of your team to my office and you should be able to uh, both verbally and also in written. I want it also in written, not in, in you know, very much detail, but just at least uh, maybe in half a page or some maybe just one page uh, indicate as to what you have done so far, starting from we had our first meeting, for instance, on such and such day, and we sort of uh, decided to share the burden among us, and I will be representing, so we decided uh, on whom to represent for instance, I mean, I'm just throwing, right, from top of my head. So, um, therefore, you will have to both in written and also verbally uh, submit uh, or give me kind of progress report so that I see you work on the subject because this is the best way to learn things. And as I said at the beginning, for those who missed, um, I would like to repeat, you are not going to be uh, uh, sort of uh, representing, of course, only your country, but you will sort of uh, uh, learn a lot from listening to others, but also in due course, while you, you will be making this research, you will have to know about other countries' sort of foreign and security policy priorities. So therefore, uh, it is something that will be uh, helping you uh, to learn many of the uh, things, especially as they pertain to the 
uh, present day situation also by making some reference to uh, the more recent past. So that will be a good ex uh, experience for all of you as far as uh, I understand. All right, we covered some parts here so far, and um, we talked about the rise of Nasser to power and that the, the impact of Nasserism, or, well, something that like this still exists. I mean, uh, as I said, back in 2006 when I was in uh, Cairo for a conference, I had an opportunity to just, you know, uh, make some observations and also talk with... Uh, scholars, experts from uh, Egypt. We talk about many things. And by the way, uh, at that time, as, a, as an anecdote, in parentheses, something as a footnote, not necessarily directly uh, relevant to what we are going to discuss today, but something important for, from our perspective is that on two different occasions, two Egyptian professors, one uh, probably during uh, at the breakfast and the other, you know, uh, lady uh, during lunch or dinner just they came to me and both of them said exact almost exactly the same thing which was uh, they said actually in the Arab world there was a new trend that and that is back in 2006 there was a new trend among scholars uh, in terms of uh, in studying as to whether the Arab world made an injustice to the Turks to the Ottomans by aligning themselves with the imperial powers, great powers, I mean, uh, Britain in the first place and, and France, after having seen what these powers have been doing uh, or have done in the Middle East, especially during the two uh, Iraq wars and more recently 2003 and onwards. So there was this search uh, or soul searching among the Arab scholars, they said, not only in Egypt but in the Arab world, in the wider Arab world, there was this somewhat a regret uh, for what they have done uh, to the Ottomans in terms of aligning themselves with great powers just to uh, expect liberation from the Ottoman rule and at what expense. So it is good that people can sit and talk about or discuss uh, the, their history with an open mind, with a sober mind approach and also as, with as much objectivity as possible. Of course, objectivity comes from uh, you know, verifiable facts, data, uh, based on uh, scientific research or on the, in the archives, in, in, in memoirs and other things, which what we call primary sources. So it is important. Um, well, this time again, uh, in two weeks' time, I'll be again in Cairo for again a uh, sort of Middle East security related uh, um, conference and I'll see if the situation has improved uh, any and well we'll see and I'll discuss this subject with my Arab colleagues. Okay let's go back to this uh, uh, the impact of uh, Nasser. One important thing uh, that we could just uh, uh, or few things about the impact of Nasser. First on, uh, of course, Egypt. Uh, and Egypt's uh, foreign and security policies, of course, under the Nasser rule, uh, has, uh, have taken a different shape. And we, have, we see here uh, there is this uh, non-aligned sort of uh, uh, attitude. And starting from the refusal to join the Baghdad Pact, this is an important development, and also not only Egypt itself, but also uh, other countries under the influence of Nasser, they stay clear from the Baghdad Pact, and which was something that was formed back in the early 50s uh, under the sort of uh, Eisenhower doctrine, which suggested local or regional countries to get together and sort of uh, in, in, in groups to stand firm against Soviet expansionism. Uh, the United States would not take active part in these uh, groups, but would give strong support, backing from outside. That was the plan, and Baghdad Pact was a was an outcome of such a uh, doctrine. So, uh, again, uh, of course, there are many, many studies, books on uh, Nasser's personality. We're not going to go into detail. I mean, this is even even this much is 
too much uh, detail for the purpose of our course, but it is important to understand as to what kind of uh, leadership he uh, displayed, he sh sort of, uh, uh, he had during his time and what and why some or certain things have happened. Because uh, ambition is something, uh, you know, somewhat dangerous if uncontrolled. Uh, it is good if you have a target, if you, if you have an objective, and it is something that motivates you to work towards it. And sometimes that achieving this goal might be difficult, so you might have to motivate yourself. You, may, you should have a certain degree of ambition. But over-ambition, if you make certain things uh, or approach in an obsessive manner, or if you cannot control your ambition, then you, can, you are more prone to make mistakes. So because, in a sense, ambition uh, blinds one's eye, and therefore you, you may not see the truth, or whenever you have to see it. So... Uh, the Suez Canal crisis, again, details are everywhere. Just click on the internet, uh, just Google it, write Suez Canal, you will have uh, pages of uh, information. So, but what matters from our perspective, what, what is essential to understand, it is something that we even yesterday, there was a whole day meeting on uh, you know, secure related issues somewhere in the city, and one Italian uh, participant uh, sort of con constructed analogy between De Gaulle's policy back in the 50s and late 50s and present day Turkey's foreign policy with respect to certain things. Well, I don't think he was right and I'm not going to go into its details, but what is important was that when Nasser proclaimed this uh, nationalization of the canal because uh, he had an arms deal, he wanted more arms to strengthen itself against uh, uh, of course, Israel in the first place and for regional prominence. And, and because Nasser dis distanced himself from the Western world, it was not possible for him to get these arms from the United States or Britain or France. And therefore, this arms deal was ostensibly on paper with, with Czechoslovakia, but behind the uh, walls, it was Soviet Union. So, but, and in order to finance this, he, he needed fresh new resources, financial resources, and one way to achieve this objective was to, you know, uh, get the revenues of the canal all by himself, and the only way to do it was nationalization. Of course, that was not acceptable, uh, not only for, you know, economic or financial reasons, but for strategic reasons, for political reasons, economic reasons, so therefore, uh, the West, especially French, uh, British, and Israel, uh, reacted, and they just, you know, uh, s uh, made s statements that that would not be acceptable, and that uh, statu quo ex ante must be uh, sort of established. But Nasser was firm. Anyway, we we see there was an offensive uh, against uh, Egypt by a combined offensive uh, by Britain, France, and Israel against Egypt. But what is interesting to note here, uh, even though Nasser distanced himself from the United States, and even though, on the other hand, Britain, France, and Israel were the two or three key allies, and Israel all the more so, I mean, uh, allies of the United States, the United States uh, just did not accept this offensive, and he, he intervened. And together with the Soviet Union, the two superpowers sort of uh, not necessarily having very good time in their relations, they, they both did not like this intervention. So that was, in many respects, the turning point in history of the Middle East and also in, in the world. Because, yes, it is true that the United States was possibly the only country which really survived the, the Second World War without much damage, if you exclude, of course, the U.S. soldiers who lost their lives and the Pearl Harbor. But other than that, physical damage and loss of lives, uh, uh, they were not as significant as the situation uh, in Europe and uh, elsewhere in Japan or in, in South East, in Pacific, etc. Even though it was the United States which sort of, as I, as I said, emerged as maybe the uh, uh, single most important power, together with the Soviet Union, but Soviet Union had undergone 
the destruction of the uh, Second World War, and, but the transition of rather uh, world dominance, if I may put it that way, uh, from Britain to the United States did not necessarily take place until this major event. Yes, uh, Britain, of course, uh, faced all this destruction, sort of uh, had to uh, uh, heal its wounds after the World War II. It was neither economically nor politically, n not at all militarily, in a very good shape. But after all, remember, Great Britain was uh, the, you know, a great power for so many centuries, from east to west. So, but, and what we have seen after World War II, uh, of course, in stages, not uh, all of a sudden, and it, it takes time, in, in especially international politics, in politics as a whole, uh, all such uh, transformations, and we, we have mentioned in the beginning of the semester that there was this decolonization process, and Britain had to withdraw from uh, you know, uh, its colonies, from territories that it sort of uh, controlled for so many decades, centuries. Uh, India was uh, one of them, out of which Pakistan was born, and we now uh, see what is happening there. So, um, but uh, the United States, uh, or the, that was a landmark event in the sense that it signed and sealed the United States uncontested supremacy, at least in the Western world. So the United States imposed its own political will on its two major allies, and of course Israel, with this event. So, uh, and since then, the United States is now, uh, since then it has been uh, accepted as the world uh, superpower, together with the Soviet Union, but for the Western world, the most important country in the eyes. Well, there are certain, of course, uh, uh, consequences of this, one of which was uh, de Gaulle's reaction in France. De Gaulle, uh, who was a very conservative person and uh, one of the most anti-American politicians that you, can, uh, you could find at the time. There are many more nowadays. Um, but, of course, that one of the consequences was maybe accelerating something that was still underway, the French atomic bomb, for instance. After 56, uh, the French uh, saw that the, they their security could not depend on the United States. They did not want to depend on the United States and not to be sort of a, too much depend on the United States, not only militarily, secu security-wise, but also politically, economically. So they, uh, De Gaulle accelerated the um, uh, French atomic bomb project, which actually culminated in the uh, detonation of their first device in 1960. So within four years' time, maybe they have gone much faster than they would have otherwise uh, had this event not taken place. And in Britain, of course, uh, the consequences were, again, uh, quite significant. Well, there was a you know, cool air between the two, but still Britain and Israel, I exclude France here, Israel and Britain are the true strategic partners of the United States. Because there is this talk in Turkey, Turkey being the strategic partner of the United States, I, I don't think this is the case. Well, some people might wish, might like to see it that way, or their sort of understanding might sort of uh, uh, suggest this. It depends on what you understand from strategic partnership, and of course, and uh, maybe uh, Turkey and the United States are strategic allies. This is true within NATO, but strategic partnership is different. It means you have to look almost every single major and also maybe le uh, less significant um, uh, d developments in the world from the same perspective, through the same window, and sit and talk before one of the parties take action and decide on what collaborative action in, in cooperation with, with one another you know, what, you know, they have to sort of uh, do or they have to take. So th this, is, this is important. And therefore, Britain and uh, Israel have been and still are and will most likely be in the foreseeable future strategic partners, and they 
sort of uh, devise their foreign and security policies with much consultations with one another, and this is important. Uh, just as a footnote, I wanted to talk about this. Uh, of course, even though, well, there was, the, the Egyptian military was in a difficult situation because Israel had again uh, landed its paratroopers on the Sinai Peninsula. They had advanced to certain uh, targets. Um, so did uh, French and British armies. The Egyptian army was not in a good shape. They were not winning the war. They were not losing the war. They were losing their men, uh, air power, and land power. But after U.S. intervention, the war had to stop. And Nasser emerged as a hero following the crisis because. Well, people do not make all these calculations as to how many tanks or how many aircraft one lost or how many men they lost as to who is the winner, who is not. But the perception in the Arab world, in the Arab streets, was that Nasser was so powerful that he sort of compelled the United States and the Soviet Union, the two superpowers, to intervene in this war against the you know, uh, other powers uh, of the world. So that was therefore important. And Nasser's prominence to a regional hero uh, sort of a, a status was pretty much with this, and this is important. And we have seen uh, uh, sort of the impact of this, uh, as you can see on, on, the, on the screen here, uh, there is this um, demand coming from Syria uh, to get united with, with Egypt. As I just sort of uh, try to s show last time. Let's have a look at this picture. Well, Egypt and Syria sort of uh, combining their uh, you know, powers well, with all this distance and also in, uh, with other sort of entities in between was not that much a practical idea, but yet, especially because of the fear of uh, uh, some Arab intellectuals and politicians, as well as the members of the army, uh, their fear from the communist expansion, uh, they sort of uh, ex ask for help uh, from Nasser. That, that, that is important, but this did not last long because uh, they were the, the, the leading personalities in Syria who would govern the country normally in Syria, in Damascus, were invited to uh, Cairo because that was the uh, joint capital of the United Arab Republic. And not only that they were far from their uh, own lands, but they were also uh, somewhat being dominated by the uh, Egyptian military, politicians, and otherwise. And after some time they have seen the impossibility of going alone for long periods, and it just lasted a few years. Uh, another important thing, especially Nasser, because he was, uh, he rose to the you know, regional power uh, position, he found in himself the responsibility to act on behalf of the Arab people, on behalf of the other Arab nations, Arab people. And although he did not have much to say, again here, uh, look at where Yemen is and where Egypt is. Well, there is, of course, not so big a distance if you just uh, compare things with distance. But he got, got involved in the uh, Yemen civil war. And this is an instance which, of course, witnessed the use of chemical weapons by Egypt against uh, uh, in, in Yemen. This is something that we always uh, take note of. Of course, as I mentioned several times, the uh, reason behind all this, or Nasser's, one of Nasser's ambition was to take the revenge of 48 defeat. But all these um, sort of uh, attempts uh, actually uh, result in much more disappointment than what, uh, when compared to what they had in mind at the beginning. Again, as the leader of the pan-Arab ideology, uh, he had several uh, uh, sort of uh, targets, objectives, one of which, of course, was to liberate Palestine from Israel occupation. Again, just to show you this map here, uh, this land, actually, and much larger land, 
was Palestine during the Ottoman Empire. Palestine is the name of this territory here. And it's not the Palestine that you think today, like which is squeezed in here, here, and not in a uniform manner anyway. So this is uh, something very much complicating things. Um, of course, another one, of course, in order to achieve this goal was to acquire military strength and in order to achieve military victory over Israel and stop Israeli expansion of territory. And each time there was a war between the Arabs and the Israelis, uh, Israel benefited from this situation basically for two reasons, maybe. Uh, first of all, yeah, on the one hand, one might think that it, is an, it, is an, it might be an advantage for uh, Arab nations to be that many in number, and therefore if they combine their powers, they could, you know, one would think from outside if he or she doesn't know anything about the sort of characteristics of the region, all these Arab nations coming together would form a bigger power, a much more powerful sort of a union uh, or alliance. But lack of coordination or, again, even though, you know, uh, they on paper seem to be, uh, you know, uh, members of the same family, Arab nations, but they was, there was always this a race a rivalry among them as to who would be the true leader of the Arab world. So th this had an impact. But on the, on the other hand, there was Israel, and still is the situation, which is almost on, on an, in alert position at all times, 24-7, every single day of the year and every year, as long as uh, they, they are there. So therefore, and always, uh, very suspicious of certain developments, always in a high alert position and uh, a sort of uh, uh, maintaining its military capability, training its citizens, not only the military, on almost every single member of the Israeli uh, population, Israeli sort of uh, uh, public is a, is a soldier in many respects, or, or they have a certain uh, trainings, uh, and they have certain um, uh, instruments, uh, let, let's say. So therefore, the, the, the confrontation between the two, these two uh, entities, in most cases, actually in all cases, resulted in uh, the victory of Israel. And not only military victory in the battlefield, but also in terms of expanding its territory. Uh, and this territory had been traded off with, uh, especially in, in the case of Egypt, for buying peace and recognition, which is something that in the past it was more important, still it is important, but not as much as uh, in the past, recognition. So therefore this is uh, important. Uh, but what happened in the June 67 war, uh, which is a six days war, uh, if you like, and within six days uh, Arab lost territory to Israel, and including Sinai and Golan, well, let me go back to the picture here. This is the Sinai Peninsula here and Golan Heights here. Well, Golan Heights are still under Israel occupation, constitute one of the most important topics in Arab-Israeli sort of uh, uh, peace negotiations or between Syria and Israel in, in, in particular. But of course, this item cannot be excluded from the rest of the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. But, uh, and in the past they were more important in the sense that from the Golan Heights, uh, Damascus was within the uh, uh, missile range of Israeli missile range or uh, because these, these are sort of a geographical location of Golan Heights uh, is sort of uh, quite conducive to you know, launching an offensive a swift offensive, very fast offensive toward Damascus. And losing capital means losing everything in war. So therefore, uh, this is important. Uh, and uh, Israelis knew exactly where they had to occupy or control in case war erupted. And they sort of went to their uh, targets rather swiftly and quickly. Uh, again, Israel after the 60, uh, 1967 uh, war in June, Six Days War. They controlled East Jerusalem, Gaza, and West Bank. Um, Gaza and the West Bank. And these are very, very important places. East Jerusalem, 
again, uh, you, you probably know from uh, information which is available everywhere that Palest a Palestinian state uh, has to have its uh, East Jerusalem as its capital. This is the uh, sort of uh, undisputed and common uh, objective of the Palestinians and the Arab nations. So, but it is still under the Israeli control and Turkey has never ever acknowledged that either. And when, for instance, in 1981, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Israel moved or proclaimed that it moved its capital from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, Turkey did not accept that, did not recognize it, and Turkey did not move its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The Turkish embassy is still in what Turkey calls the Israeli capital or recognized as Israeli capital in Tel Aviv. So this is an important thing. And we'll, we'll talk about this in the coming weeks and we will talk about Turkish-Israeli relations. Um, yeah, of course, Palestinians. Yes, Ibrahim? No, that was in 1973, Yom Kippur War. Uh, that, and that actually is something that we, uh, we will just uh, in a moment, most probably or in the next hour, we'll discuss. And it had a number of consequences. And for you, uh, for the purpose of getting prepared for the midterm exam, I mean, I don't ask specific uh, detailed questions as to now, what was the name of such and such person or what was the date of such and such event? But I want you to uh, sort of uh, have the capability to make this analysis about the consequences of certain major developments. For instance, a question about what were the consequences or implications of 67 war, or as we will discuss in, in a moment, uh, the consequence of 1973 Yom Kippur War. These are the things that you should keep in mind. Of course, I want you to learn things in such a way that you don't forget for a long time. Because, I mean, I myself, I'm not very good in memorizing things, and I, don't ex I cannot expect you to do this. Uh, uh, so therefore, uh, try to understand what were the causes of certain things and what were the consequences of certain things. Because causes and consequences are the most important things in, in an, an analytical study. And if you mix them up, you end up with different results, different interpretations. And to me, it is my you know, a personal criterion, I mean, which I sort of uh, adopt in, you know, uh, in trying to scale the, the qualifications of someone, either as an academic or not, uh, is whether he or she makes uh, this distinction between causes and consequences. Because if you cannot distinguish between causes and consequences, you're confused and you end up with different and most possibly wrong results. So therefore, try to follow this, this, this class discussion and make your readings f with a view to understanding what were the causes of such and such thing and what were the consequences of such and such development, right? So other than that, if you can keep things, names, dates, places in mind, well, fine, uh, you're, you're better off. But if you cannot, just don't worry, try to understand what exactly was the impact of June 67 war on Middle East politics or, June, uh, or uh, uh, this 1973 uh, war in Yom Kippur Day, uh, etc. So again, uh, Palestinians were the ones who were most affected because when the United Nations issued that resolution which paved the way to the creation of the State of Israel, Palestinian people were also given the right well, because of many reasons, uh, the lack of Arab unity and the Palestinians expected more, et cetera, et cetera, or they just, by way of opposing uh, uh, certain decisions, you know, uh, maybe they, they misinterpreted uh, the certain things or they have not had this uh, longer term ver uh, vision as to what or how Israelis would benefit from the situation, et cetera. So the Palestinians did not have their state and Palestinian people, who were abundant in the region, since they had no nation, uh, they were mostly affected from uh, this in the first place, and they, most of them, have become refugees. Some of them, you know, lived in countries like uh, in the region, 
uh, but the, the a great percentage, uh, an overwhelming majority of the Jordanian uh, population consists of Palestinian people. And still there are millions of Palestinians who live in refugee camps today who are dislocated and their number uh, is increasing rather fast. And it is one of the most uh, uh, critical issues in the Arab-Israeli peace, uh, peace process because one of the sine qua non conditions of the Palestinian side and also some you know, great powers like the European Union, United States to some extent, uh, they, they want the, these Palestinians to have a, a, a nation, a country, whereas uh, one of the uh, suggestions is to sort of uh, have them you know, stay where they are uh, in Jordan and in, in, in the neighboring countries, but also one of the proposals, especially the Palestinians insist on that, and Arab nations back them up, I mean support this idea is to return to Israel. But it is, uh, because it is extremely critical from the Israeli perspective, I think it was Isan who asked that question to me last time, the, uh, the Jewishness of the uh, state of Israel is important. You asked that, right? So because th the demographic nature of Israel is something out of you know, dispute. Israelis cannot discuss this. The Jewish character of Israeli state, in their view, must be preserved. And if all these refugees, whose number was like 2 million maybe 15, 20 years ago, now amount to 4, four and a half or 5 million in the surrounding countries and in Jordan, in the second, third generations now, and uh, if they all go back to uh, uh, Israel, not only that there is not enough space, but also if they all went uh, to Israel, considering that some 20% of the Israeli population today is uh, uh, Arab, I mean, consists of Arab people, not necessarily Jewish, and therefore the whole demographic, demographic, I mean, the, the population-wise, the percentages will, will be upset, and Israelis cannot accept that. But uh, Palestinians insist on that, just like they insist on East Jerusalem to be the capital of Palestine. So there are this kind of deadlocks in the Arab-Israeli issues. And when someone comes up with uh, like a formula, a magic formula uh, in hand as, you know, waving this uh, like a Chamberlain in the past after his uh, meeting with Hitler, saying that, yes, I got the peace. I mean, so when, when, when some people come up with this kind of peace proposals and uh, uh, gives an image that things are, you know, going to be resolved anytime soon, just be calm and don't be too much excited because this is Middle East and it, solutions are not that easy. Of course, you don't have to be pessimistic, but you have to be cautious in terms of approaching to all these kind of proposals. I remember quite vividly, probably it was two years or so ago, maybe two and a half years, there was this Annapolis meeting. And, you know, scholars, experts, or so-called experts were making comments uh, on TV interviews and so excited. And this time Bush got it all the way. And so he's going to resolve all these sort of uh, uh, problems in the Middle East. I said, look, <laughs> wait a minute. I mean, there are such and such almost uh, entirely incompatible demands from both sides, and how will you uh, sort of commensurate them? How will you square them with one another? So this is therefore not something that easy, but of course both sides must make concessions, uh, otherwise uh, none of these issues can be resolved. But again, going back to the Palestinians, the situation of the Palestinian people and uh, if you consider that you know, in the Middle East, a great an overwhelming majority of populations are young and who suffer the consequences, but still more prone to radicalization, of course, they fall into the hands of such groups who, to some extent, exploit their uh, youth and, and their position, their ideologies. And we have seen uh, Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, well, it has undergone uh, a number of uh, changes ever since uh, uh, what was in the past accepted as a terrorist organization now today, uh, something that is 
respected much more and also recognized as an entity uh, to sort of uh, take part in negotiations. Uh, and um, this is therefore something that you have to bear in mind and understand why some of the uh, is Palestinian groups are having difficulty in getting along with one another in, in peaceful manner. Again, one of the other consequences uh, was the you know Baathist coup took control in Iraq and Syria because 67 war was humiliation of the regimes in uh, Iraq and Syria, and these are important developments to bear in mind. Oh, okay, let's give a break here. We have five more minutes, but I just want to start this part, uh, and then we'll continue with. 70s and 80s.